This podcast is brought to you by Al Jazeera. He met her in the fall. He took her to a movie. And when they done it all, he took her to Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer and this week we're joined by political pranksters and filmmakers, the Yes Men. We'll learn their real names later as we screen their cheeky new documentary, The Yes Men Fix the World. The Yes Men uncover corporate skeletons Ooh, surprise. through interpretive dance. But do these men always say yes? This is the best way to do it. No. Also on the show, director Michelle Haneke has always shown the dark side of humanity. But has he found a new direction? The love stories. I like them. <laughs> Me too. But first, Poland has given us much more than its fair share of great filmmakers, but there is one that towers above the rest. FPS's Lama Mata recently climbed that tower and met the master, Andre Vida. From the bitter aftermath of World War II, through the solidarity movement of the 1980s, to stories that can only now be told. <laughs> Andrzej Wajda has remained Poland's most essential filmmaker for over half a century. In Katyn, his recent Oscar-nominated World War II epic might be his best. It revisits the massacre by Stalin's troops of more than 20,000 Polish officers in intelligentsia. A war crime they blamed on the Nazis. Until the truth emerged 50 years later. Amongst the victims, Vida's father. How draining is it emotionally to work on a project for so, so many months when it's so personal to you? I've been making films for the last 50 years, and in all my films, my personal emotions are involved. If the director is not really involved in what he's doing in his films, then it all stays really, really cool, and the audience can't really follow and can't really remember such a film. Vida has followed the epic scale of Katyn with Tatarak, a portrait of one woman's loss. After such a big story, did you personally go out to make a more intimate story, something about someone's grief? After Katyn, which is a very politically and socially important film, I was thinking of doing something different, something fresh. I thought that doing a film like Tatarak would give me and the audience a chance to experience something different. A film within a film, Tatarak follows Christina Yonder's character Marta, a mother grieving the loss of her sons to World War II, suddenly distracted by a young protege. This story is interwoven with a monologue by Yonder. Mourning her late husband, Vida's esteemed cinematographer, Edward Klasinski. Tatarak wasn't just another emotional journey for Vida. It's also marked a reunion with Yanda. It is, I think, the most personal role in my career and the most personal story. Vida last directed Yanda 28 years ago when she co-starred with Solidarity leader Lech Wałęsa in the shockingly anti-Soviet Man of Iron. Working with Andrzej is always such a surprise. I feel like I'm being launched into other space. With Yanda helping him capture history as it happened, Man of Iron won Vida the Palm d'Or at Cannes. She was in her 20s when you worked with her last. How much has she changed as an actor? Christina has been directing things herself, so she understands me better now than she did all those many years ago when we were making Man of Iron. So this reunion, after all those years, was a reunion of two mature directors, two mature people who know each other very well. Gniejących rybich łusek. 
błota. Ciągle spodziewam się. I strongly believe that there are still many stories to make films out of, and this is my idea for life. Austria's Michal Haneke has been one of the world's most exciting filmmakers for at least a decade. But now he's taken it to a whole other level, winning the top prize at the Cannes Film Festival with a totally lacerating new film. Müssen alle sterben? Ja. Und die Mama? Ist die auch tot? Ja. Die ist auch tot. <lacht> Set in Germany just before the First World War, Michal Haneke's The White Ribbon is a riveting portrait of cruelty and violence in a rural village. Also, woher denkst du kommen die Veränderungen, die diesem Knaben schließlich ein so erbärmliches Ende bereiteten? I mean, this is a very horrible place, this tiny little village, this ensemble of... It's a very of... nice place. I wouldn't want to live there, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to, because they're terrifying. The landscape, the landscape is so nice. It's beautiful, but yeah. the people there are pretty horrible. Yeah, but horrible. it's not the landscape, it's not the place, that's the people. Hypocrisy, dogma and sporadic acts of brutality paint a grim picture of the human soul. Der Knabe hatte bei irgendjemand gesehen, dass der sich an den feinsten Nerven seines Körpers schadete, wo auch Gottes Gebot heilige Schranken errichtet hat. And this has implications far beyond this little German hamlet. This is before World War I. Mm -hmm. So the generation of these children are the same generation that took us into World War II. That's the generation which was 13, 14 and 15 at the time. The generation which was the adult generation of the Nazi era. The Knabe ahmte diese Handlung nach und konnte nicht mehr damit aufhören. Zerrüttete so schließlich alle Nerven seines Körpers derart, dass er daran zugrunde ging. At the Cannes press conference, Haneke presented his film as a warning that any idea, political or religious, when taken as an absolute truth, will devolve into extremism. All forms of terrorism spring from the same source, so I don't want this film to be taken as a film just about fascism. You have said throughout the festival, you said this is not just about Germany, that this is a universal comment. But I wondered, why did you set it in Germany then? You're an Austrian. Because it's a very German film and because German history is a very exemplary illustration for this position and for this time. The film's sobering message struck a chord with the Cannes jury, winning the Austrian director his first Palm d'Or. Renowned for his detached outlook and unequivocally nasty characters. Haneke's films force us to examine our casual consumption of violence as entertainment. Yeah! Funny Games, which sees a middle-class family terrorised by unknown intruders, has the elements of a classic thriller. But when the villains turn their gaze in our direction, Haneke reminds us that we are in fact complicit in the horror unfolding. She will with us that she morgen um neun noch leben, wir mit ihnen, dass sie tot sind. Okay? Was meinen Sie? Denken Sie, Sie haben eine Chance zu gewinnen? The Piano Teacher is a startling portrait of lust and masochism starring French icon Isabelle Huppert. As a repressed piano teacher who specializes in Schubert and self-mutilation. Once again using the thriller hook to reel in the audience, Haneke's widely admired hidden espèce de lâche. places a well-to-do Parisian family in the gaze of a secret camera. Comment j'ai fait pour pas le voir ce type euh, c'est un mystère. Hein? When they start to receive anonymous tapes and disturbing messages, long buried misdeeds from husband Georges' childhood explode into present day bloodshed. A theme strongly reprised in the white ribbon. As again returning to this that it isn't just about Germany, but it certainly seems to be a very strong comment about becoming accustomed to violence in that generation. Well, those who are victims of violence are more prepared to commit violence. That's a known fact. Warum weinst du? Soll ich dir das Geständnis ersparen? Nicht wahr, du hast das getan, was ich eine arme Knobbe tat. Ja. 
part two, we're screening the Yes Men Fix the World. I've got the Yes Men, though I don't know the names, so I'm not going to use your names, OK? OK. <laughs> but I want to tell them what you do. You are anti-globalisation activists. Mm -hmm. Some call you renowned troublemakers, cruel, sick, all the rest. What are you? Cruel and sick. <laughs> renowned troublemakers. I think we need a spanking. Yeah. Basically to, uh, yeah, besides needing a spanking, we, uh, we play tricks I, on people in order to... Humiliate them. Yeah, and call attention to what they're doing in the world. I mean, they're destroying the world. There are people destroying the world. There are. So we wanted to hurt them. Yeah, what he said. Yeah. All right. No spankings on this show. But in part two, we'll find out how they do want to fix the world. He met her in the fall. Everybody, welcome to this special screening of the Yes Men Fix the World. At the moment, you're going under Andy and you're going under Mike, right? Right. You got so us there, yep. Mm. I gotcha. But they're not their real names, obviously. Tell us who you are and tell us about your film. Well, we impersonate corporations and we speak at big conferences in the name of the corporations in order to bring attention to the misdeeds of the corporations and of the market in general. Mike? Uh, we started making this movie about four years ago, um, when we got an invitation from the BBC to appear on the 20th anniversary of the Bhopal catastrophe and to make a statement. And that's kind of uh, became the beginning of a long journey where we explored really what Dow's motivations were as a company and in general what uh, could happen if we keep letting the market lead uh, us as a civilization. In 1984, when Union Carbide's pesticide plant at Bhopal exploded, at least 5,000 people died within weeks. It was the biggest industrial disaster in history. When Dow Chemical bought Union Carbide in 2001, they promised fair compensation for Carbide's past negligence. But we knew they wouldn't, so we decided to do it for them. After the Yes Men set up a fake website pretending to be official Dow representatives, they were contacted by BBC News. Joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finisterra. And invited to make a statement on behalf of Dow on live TV. For the first time, Dow is accepting full responsibility for the Bhopal catastrophe. The effect of this announcement was a $2 billion drop in Dow's market value in just 23 minutes. But this wasn't the first time the duplicitous duo created media shockwaves. Louisiana officials are taken for a ride by the Yes like Men. The Yes Men. World-renowned troublemakers. Sick, twisted, cruel. We target people we see as criminals, and we steal their identity to try to make them honest or to try to present a more honest face. In their first film, the pair posed as spokesman for the WTO, launching a new device. <laughs> for exploitative employers to monitor sweatshop workers. And they extolled the virtues of recycling human waste on behalf of McDonald's as a solution to food shortages in developing nations. In the Yes Men Fix the World, they impersonate Halliburton reps, pitching the paranoid elite a new product to survive calamities. Uh, if you could demonstrate the turtle position, please, that would be great. And then, in post-Katrina New Orleans, they pose as Washington bureaucrats, telling displaced public housing residents they could finally return home. This afternoon, we will begin to reopen all public housing projects in New Orleans. And that private developers would not be grabbing their properties. <laughs> and finally, the pranksters turn publishers and decide to write the headlines themselves. Blanketing Manhattan with a utopian version of the New York Times dated six months into the future. Extra, extra, read all about it. The New York Times declares the war in Iraq is over. This is real. This is too good to be true. <laughs> but it's not impossible. When I watch your film, at the very end of it, it's so full of optimism that people do want to fix the world, that you're certainly not alone. I think that, that, that what that final gesture the New York Times project does is it just helps us imagine how easy it could be to fix the world. If these are the headlines that people were so excited to read this morning, um, let's make them happen. The story throughout that paper is that the only way these things will happen is through the pressure of people like all of us. 
Is this more about you two, this celebritization of activism? This is a movie in which the two of us fix the world. I mean, we're trying to get the word out there through the medium of television and movies. Um, and to do that, you have to, it has to be funny. We're on our way to a conference, and Erastus Ham is going to be speaking. When you have an audience who believes that you are who you say you are, they actually suspend your disbelief. My name is Hannaford Schmidt. I'm with the World Trade Organization. I'm from Arizona. Uh, my name is Francisco Guerrero. And also, the character is so simple. It's just some bumbling PR flack who, you know, <laughs> we can all do it. Well, joining us live from Paris now is Jude Finisterra. He's a spokesman for Dow Chemical. You probably recognized um, Stephen Cole, one of the faces of Al Jazeera, who was working for BBC at the time. Do you now accept responsibility for what happened? Steve, yes. It's not usual when you say to somebody, do you accept responsibility, that they say yes. Today is a great day for all of us at Dow, and I think for millions of people around the world as well. And Stephen says... It threw him off. Just to uh, reiterate what Jude Finisterra, the spokesman for Dow Chemicals, has just said, he says Dow Chemicals now fully accept responsibility. He believes that, if anything, the story was hijacked and it became a story about a hoax on the BBC versus what Dow's responsibilities should have been. In some ways, that was the case in the UK, but it wasn't the case in the United States. The UK was doing an tremendous job. It was on the news almost every night for a week. In the U.S., there were no stories, zero. And Dow is, of course, headquartered in the United States. So I think Stephen is probably right about the U.K., where a lot of people just saw it as a, a story about the prank. Whereas in the U.S., they had to spend most of the article explaining what Bhopal was, Dow was, Union Carbide were, and couldn't get to the false hopes, I think. Jude, that, that's good news that you have finally accepted responsibility. Uh, some people would say too late. It shouldn't be seen as um, a, a big mistake by the BBC. It really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, after one hour, millions of people learned about Bhopal and yeah. learned about Dow and Union Carbide. It was incredibly telling that Dow didn't take any action against you, wasn't it? I mean, I, I think that any more attention that Dow would get from attacking us would be negative attention for them because you know I, when you all you have to do is see a kid drinking that poison water, and then you say like, what is going on here? Why aren't they Why aren't they cleaning this up? Communities that you see in red have not gotten a single drop of clean water. Mm -hmm. Oh really? Yeah, eight communities are getting about twelve percent of the requirement. Do you think the news media could accept a greater responsibility in questioning those institutions that you guys are bringing to to the attention? In the case of the New Orleans um, media, you see a reporter from um, New Orleans television going up to a former resident of a housing project, Lafitte Housing Project, and saying, so do you know this is a big hoax? And the woman looks right at the camera person and says, I respect this hoax because maybe it'll take a hoax like this to bring them out here to see what we're going through. And yet she reports that the victims had false hopes. So she knew what she was going to report on, and the evidence didn't matter. So if the host would it be, a host is what we got. And I ain't mad. I'm going to eat some barbecue. How effective would you say your approach to exposing these injustices is? Unfortunately, the uh, housing projects were destroyed. All we can do is contribute to a movement, and we can't expect each little thing that we do to result in concrete change. But overall, we, we do have hope. CTV News. Good evening. A bizarre situation today at the Go Expo Energy Conference at Stampede Park. Organizers and hundreds of Alberta oil and gas executives got duped. This is where you create the alternate biofuel by using human flesh. Our friend Reggie. He's really cute. Shame that he's so sick. Um, is he all right? <laughs> was. <laughs> was so sick. It was time to introduce Reggie Watts, the dying Exxon janitor who had volunteered to be turned into fuel. I think I'd like to be a, a, a candle. There's just so many uses for a candle. I mean, you know, like if you, if you want something romantic, like that'd be nice to know I was a candle on table. I can't fathom that anybody is sitting there and not, not just saying, who are these clowns? What you see here is an artist's rendition of an advanced large-scale plant. It's obviously one of your great tactics employees is to have ridiculous animation. I mean, when you see the body go through something like out of a Pink Floyd music video being minced, 
as the alternate, you know, fossil fuel of the future. With greater supply, the dance of capital appears in full flower. I was just wondering what type of repercussions you've experienced because of the film. I mean, the worst that could happen is that the, the security takes us away. Apparently, we're not allowed to have a funerary observance for a man who's died to make a product possible. And they don't really know what to do about it because they think, well, what if? It's always there in the back of their mind. What if I really have taken this person who's really from Exxon to this holding room and I'm basically like holding them against their will. What's going to happen to me? What are your credentials with ExxonMobil? So, what is it? Sorry? That, what part of it do you have? Please, sure. Let, let's talk about the use of humor here in political activism. You're convinced that this is the best way to do it? No. No? See, that's your pranking now, yeah? No. We hope to be cheerleaders and to, you know, try to get, get the message across as best we can, but it's, uh, you can't say it's the best thing to do. It's just what we are good at. How many of you are there? We, we have hundreds of thousands of job openings at the Yes Men. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you go to uh, www.theyesmen.org slash join, um, you can sign up on our database. And we will send you email if there is something in your area that we think is worth doing or that we're planning. Anybody want to be a Yes Man or a Yes Woman? Yes! yes. <laughs> Could we please thank Andy and Mike, let's call them today, for bringing the Yes Men Fix the World. Okay, I'm on the phone with HUD right now and they say you're a liar. Okay, well they can say whatever they want. I'm sorry? They can say whatever they'd like. They can say whatever they'd like, but you work for them, don't you, as a deputy secretary? That's right. I'm Amanda Palmer. This is the Fabulous Picture Show, and I'm welcome back. I'm Amanda Palmer. <laughs> Sorry, he's funny. Amanda Palmer. <laughs> this is not funny. I don't think this is funny at all. I'm Amanda Palmer. This is the end of the Fabulous Picture Show, and you two are never coming back. Oh, you are we just might. too badly behaved. <laughs> What's the next hoax? It's too big mm, to tell you about, yeah. but it's happening. Yeah, it's happening. It's happening. It's all around you, yes. It's, it's happening in you. If you want to get involved, you know where to go, the website. The yesmen.org. And basically... <laughs> You two have got to learn to behave a little bit, huh? You're not like this at home, are you? Slash join. I'm not going to bring up spankings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know that's what you're after. <laughs> <laughs>I thought it was really amusing and, and it dealt with very serious issues. What the film proves and what it proves to me is that there's actually just a simple formula and it's just about questioning the authorities that we take for granted.